morning. So, so I, uh, I watch a lot of ridiculous things on YouTube. I don't know if you're like me. Um, and so the other day, I'm watching this video of this guy, and he's getting chased by a lion on the uh, plains of Africa, and this lion is chasing him, and you know, he's all mic'd up and whatnot, and, and it's chasing him, he's getting closer and closer to where, I mean, he can feel the, the breath of this beast on the back of his neck, I mean, he's, he's running, and realizing that this is not, he's not gonna make it, it's over for him, um, and sometimes when we, we come to that place in our, in our own life, when it's just kind of like, okay, I don't even know what to do anymore. Um, sometimes we, we just throw up prayers and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're just ridiculous if we're honest with ourselves. And, and so as he's running, he just, he just throws out this prayer and he just says, God, make this lion a Christian. And, and, he, and, he, keeps, and he keeps running and he keeps running. And all of a sudden he stops hearing himself being chased. And so he kind of turns back and, and oh, the lion was back there. And the craziest thing was is the lion looks like it's in like this, like this position of prayer. And it's like jowls are flapping and moving. And so the dude's like trying to, to, trying to come around the lion and get away from the lion. And as he got closer, all of a sudden, he hears the lion praying, bless Lord this food that I'm about to partake in. And um, I didn't see that on YouTube and it's not real. Um, but I just thought it was a, a great uh, story to illustrate uh, what the prayer life of most Christians looks like. We're good with praying for our Chick-fil-A and, and whatever meal that is set before us. We're good. We'll pray. And for some of us, that's like the extent of our prayer life. We pray before meals and that makes us feel good about our, ourselves, but I think that if we, if we were really throughout this series able to embrace the biblical realities of what prayer is, it's going to change us. It's not just going to change us as people, as individuals, but it's going to change us as a church. And it's not just going to change us as a church, but it's going to change our community and our, and our city. I believe that. I believe that with my whole heart. If we would just embrace all that the scriptures have to say about prayer. I have seen God heal, literally and physically. Like, like that, not like I prayed a prayer and then 50 years later the person got, no, I mean like pray a prayer and I've been healed physically. I've watched, I've watched God open doors that nobody can open through the power of prayer. I've watched God close doors that nobody could close through the power of prayer. I've watched God, greatest miracle of all, save people spiritually through prayer. I've even seen God save people physically through the power of prayer. I'll never forget being woken up from my bed in, in the middle of the night by the Lord and, and just this, this heavy burden to pray for my younger brother. And, and, and I'll never forget, I get up. I felt like it was not one of those ones I could just lay there with my head on the pillow and pray. It was like God was like, no, you get up. Get up and get on your knees. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I got on my knees and I began to pray prayers for my brother, specific prayers that God would keep him safe. I knew he was out partying. I knew we had fast cars and you never know what's going to happen with fast cars and alcohol that late at night. And so I began to pray specific prayers for him. And I kid you not, a few hours later, about three or four in the morning, my mom burst into my room and she said, Jimmy, your brother was in an accident. And you know, everything goes in like slow motion at that point. So I'm thinking, what in the world is happening? I just got out of my bed and I just prayed. Why has he gotten in an accident? God, why didn't you spare him from that accident? And then as I'm thinking those very thoughts, my mom says this, um, but it was crazy. He, he hit this car uh, going 90 miles an hour on the, on, the, on, the, on the parkway and the car was airborne and, and spun in the air. It hit the, 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 the cement center divider and, and after it hit it, um, there was just enough room, uh, just enough room for him to open the door, get out, walk away. And as he was walking away, the entire car was engulfed in flames and, and, and it was done, totaled, finished. Not a scratch on him, not a bump, not a bruise, not whiplash, not nothing. And he walked away from this, scratching his head. And I had the privilege of sharing with him that God did that, that God did that. 
I've seen God move in so many miraculous ways that, that I could spend literally this entire time up here just sharing praise reports and, and stories of, of God's faithfulness and God how, how God has, has literally acted in my life and in the life of, of people I know and love and in so many of your lives um, here as, as Christians, as brothers and sisters who are part of this, this church family. And, and as I, I think about how a powerful prayer is and how great it is that we have this opportunity as fallible, fallen human beings to, to communicate with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God who literally spoke the earth into, into existence and then holds it all together. That we can communicate with God and I think about this, and, and it causes me to think this. It causes me to think that, that prayerlessness will be the greatest regret of every pastor, of every church leader, of every church, of every Christian. When, when, we, when we go to breathe our last, when we go to stand before the Lord, it's not a matter of, you, you didn't pray enough, you're not saved. We're not talking about that. But I just, I can't help but think. I mean, E.M. Bounds, right? He wrote a book as fat as the dictionary on on. Prayer is incredible and an incredible work. I'd, I'd encourage you to get it. But even he, at the end of his life, said, man, I wish I would have prayed more. I wish I would have prayed more. Prayerlessness speaks to a lack of intimacy. Prayerlessness speaks to a lack of understanding. Prayerlessness speaks to a lack of faith. Prayerlessness speaks to a lack of belief. Prayerlessness speaks to the lack of power in the life of a believer. You show me a believer who has a lazy prayer life, and I'll show you a believer who's having struggles with getting victory over sin. My biggest concern in the church today is our attitude towards prayer. It's our attitude towards prayer. Because we've all heard it said, and, and perhaps we've even said it. I know I have. When we've tried to fix it and we've tried to, and, and, and then we've come to the end of ourselves and we say things like, well, all we can do now is pray. That is, that is, a, that is an admission of a gross lack of understanding of prayer. It is not, well, all we can do is, no, 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 we need to pray. And prayer should be the first thing. Prayer should be what we're doing while we're trying to fix it. Prayer should be the thing we do after it in thanksgiving and praise. I mean, we should be a people who are praying. If but for any other reason, Jesus Christ died on a cross, rose again from the dead, conquering sin and death so that we could have access, Hebrews tells us, to the throne room of God. That is so crazy that a perfect, sinless, holy God has allowed access to sinful people, because of the blood of Jesus, we can, we can enter in to the presence of God and talk to God. The God who hung the moon and the stars, the God who holds all things together. This God we get the privilege of access to. The fact that prayer meetings are the least attended gatherings in any given church speaks to the lack of genuine belief that prayer is what God says it is. I think intellectually, we would, we would, as Christians, we would claim understanding. We would claim real belief that God actually hears our prayers and that God actually answers. I think intellectually, we would all, as Christians, we would, we would agree on that. But our um, actions, uh, or lack thereof, would call us a liar. If we're honest. See, prayer, prayer is an admission of our dependence. That's what it is. It really is an, an admission of our dependence. See, the, the self-assured person, the self-assured person is not going to pray a prayer of petition. Why? Because the self-assured person thinks they've got it all together and that they can do it and that they can figure it out. And the, and, and the self-righteous person, well, they're not going to pray any prayers of confession because why? Because, because I've got this. Because my righteousness will lead to blessings from God. But the person who has a right understanding of who God is, that person, the person who knows their heart before God, who knows the depths of the forgiveness that was, that was needed, 
The person who could say like the Apostle Paul and do like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, where, where he's, like, he's like, I'm on bended knees. Do, do you not understand that, that Jewish people in those days, especially Jewish leaders and, and teachers and rabbis, they didn't get on their knees. They prided themselves on the fact that they stood as they prayed. And, but Paul's like, no, 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 no. I bow my knees before the Father. That is an individual who understands right relationship with God. Understands who he is and who God is. And it's my prayer that we be a people like that. A people that get it. The, listen, the Apostle Paul achieved great things. The Apostle Paul, he turned the world right side up in his ministry here on earth. Uh, through the Apostle Paul's uh, preaching alone, he set the entire region surrounding the Mediterranean on fire. And that gospel fire went into Jerusalem and Turkey and Greece and Western Rome. I mean, God, God was using this man to do incredible things. There, perhaps there is no other man save Jesus who has done more in the history of mankind than the Apostle Paul. Why do I tell you this? Because the Apostle Paul was a man given to prayer. You cannot divorce his preaching from prayer, his ministering from prayer. He was a man that was, he was, he was given to it. He uses words when describing his prayer life like, I labor in prayer. When's the last time any of us have labored in prayer? I don't know about you, but sometimes I treat prayer like it's like this inconvenience. If I'm honest with you, as, as the pastor of this church, it's easier for me to study for five hours than to pray for you for one. It just is. You go, oh, if I pray, then I'm going to run out of things to pray. And I'm gonna think, and, and, and I have to fix that. And I have to constantly do battle against that mentality because I recognize that the preaching of God's word, that the teaching of the Bible, that the ministering to individuals in this community, so much of it is connected to my dependence on prayer, my dependence on God to move and God to act and, and God to soften hearts and, and open minds and, and, and God to draw people to himself. I can't do any of that stuff. I can be obedient to the little, the practical things that God is calling me to do, but I can't change people. I can't transform a community. God has to do it. And I have to be dependent on Him in prayer. What would you give to see revival in New York City? To see real, true, genuine revival in New York City. Have you ever read stories of revival? It's incredible. I want that. I want that. I, I, like Jim Symbol, I'm in this place now where I'm just like, God, let not my life pass before me without me seeing a genuine revival in New York City. That's what I want to see. And I know, I don't think or believe, I know that that is going to start with prayer. It has to start with prayer. Because it's a work that I cannot do if all of the churches in all of New York City, the big ones, the medium-sized ones, the little ones, if we all came together... If we all came together and sought to do some practical things to bring transformation to our city, it wouldn't work without prayer. God can do more with the prayers of one individual than all the churches in all the world. How often do we see God saving people in third world countries where there is no Bible study, there's no, there's no church, there's no, no, God's showing up to them in dreams and revealing himself to them. And some people may be like, no, I don't know if I believe all of that. Why would somebody make that up? They're being excommunicated from their family, imprisoned, put to death. Why wouldn't they just continue to live comfortably in their faith or their um, false religion? But no, but Jesus is appearing to people. God can do more with the prayers of one individual. And the Apostle Paul had such great examples, whether that was Abraham or whether that was, was King David. King David was such a, a great example. Have you ever read the Psalms? Any of the Psalms? Some of the Psalms? I would encourage you to start reading the Psalms. I mean, incredible, incredible. You're getting to read the prayers of King David. And the prayers of King David are so worshipful. Sometimes I'll just, I'm like, like when I do feel like I just don't know what to pray, I'll open the Psalms and I'll just pray the Psalms over my life, over your lives. I'll just pray the word of God. 
Because sometimes I'm thinking, his prayers are so much better than mine. Let me, just, let me just give you a taste, just a taste. Psalm 86. Psalm 86, it, it says this. Why don't we do this? It's a prayer. So let's close our eyes. I want to read this prayer. And you tell me that this is not a guy doing work with the Lord. Okay? Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord. For I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord. For I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am distressed, I call to you because you answer me. Among the lowercase g gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All of the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and you do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord, my God, with all of my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love towards me. Paul learned from guys like David. He learned from guys like David. But he also learned from guys like Jesus. Jesus, who is literally God. None of us are so busy that we're, we're like, like, like Jesus had crowds constantly pressing him, constantly wanting something from him. And yet Jesus saw it necessary as God to wake up before anybody else and get away with the Father. He knew that in order to minister to people and love people the way that he was a called to his, his mission here on earth, that he needed to spend time in the presence of the Father. And Paul saw, Paul saw that pattern, that example in the life of Jesus. There, there is relationship there. There is dependence there. There is understanding that is there. One of my favorite uh, just straight Bible teachers, um, Alistair Begg, he says this. He says, my prayers, whether I pray, how much I pray, about what I pray, reveal my priorities. And they reveal how much I really think I need God. <sighs> Or whether I am, deep down in fact, self-assured and self-righteous. If the Apostle Paul, as an Apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, who bows his knee before the Father, what about you and I? If Jesus, who again is God saw it necessary to be in the presence of the Father in prayer. What about you and I? Here's the deal. We all want results. But oftentimes, very few of us are willing to embrace the necessary disciplines. Want the results, the disciplines... Why do you think 90% of this church is probably done with their New Year's resolution? Because we got lofty goals, but the disciplines to get there? No. It's too much work. It's too much effort. And so I ask again, do you want to see revival in New York City? Because I believe it's going to take some discipline. And we're going to talk about what some of those disciplines are in, in just a moment. Today is not, listen, this is not your normal Bible study at Roots Church. We will, we will resume that next week in part two when Pastor Rich, who is sick, pray for him, uh, is back here. His whole family is sick. He's back here and, and he's going to be um, just teaching an incredible, incre I've, I've never been more excited to hear a message from, from Rich than I am next week. Be, because this is a message that, that um, he has said God gave him the moment we, we unrolled our new um, a prayer initiative for this church. And so I'm excited about that. We're, we're going to jump right back into that kind of verse by verse, line upon line. We're getting into the meat of the word. Today is more a vision casting for where we're going.
And it's my heart that we would be a people who just got it, who, who understood, who understood prayer. And that's what we're going to seek to do over the next couple weeks is to, to gain a greater understanding of not, not only our, our need f- f- for God to do the work, but just on a personal level, our, our need for that, that, that relationship with God where, where we are in constant dialogue with the Father. I love this. It, it was said of Hudson Taylor. It was said of Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China. It was said that, that for 40 years... The sun had never risen in China without God seeing Hudson Taylor on his knees. For 40 years before the sun, every day he was up before the sun to pray for the people of China. And the work that God did in China, China has never been the same. The the China Inland Mission is, is still around today. The amount of people who have come to faith in Christ because of that, that ministry, I just think to myself, wow. A man given to prayer. See, that, that very Alistair Begg says that if uh, the spiritual hub of my life is strong, uh, then the practical spokes will be as well. And I think that's important because before we ever get to corporate prayer, we need to understand our, our need for, for personal and private prayer. That we would be people who pray in the closet before we play in the, pray in the streets. That we would understand that it's, it's, it's through communing with God, it's through prayer that we're going to find that strength. We're going to find that, that spiritual hub that will make all of the practical areas of life. So oftentimes when we pray, we pray, we pray for the spokes and we miss the hub. But the reality is, is if we take care of the hub, our core, God will take care of the spokes, the practical, personal areas, the fringe areas. And I was so convicted of this as I read uh, through Ephesians this week. And I was looking at the, the prayers of Paul. Man, one of these years, we just got to, we've, we've gone verse by verse through Ephesians. I'd love to just focus on the prayers in Ephesians. Because when you read the prayers of Paul in Scripture, you realize that his prayers are so kingdom focused. Everything is about the kingdom. And then when you take a step back and recognize the historical context of it and that Paul's in prison and that Paul's, you know, he may be facing death. And all he cares about is the furtherance of the gospel. All he cares about is the kingdom of God. God's agenda, God's kingdom. Living in a, and ministering to a people a body of believers in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul was ministering to a people who lived in a city who was, it was sort of like ancient New York City. It was a city that was booming financially. It was a city that was, I mean, it, it, was, it was a port city. It, it had, had ton, tons of commerce. I mean, there were, it was the happening place to be, Ephesus was. But Ephesus was also steeped in paganism and idol worship. And so many of the people who were coming out of that stuff, the occult, and to Christ were were constantly having to battle against these things. And and the Apostle Paul is is teaching and training them all throughout the book of Ephesians how to to find your strength in prayer. How, How to put on armor that is not physical but spiritual. Teaching them that there is a battle in the spiritual realm that, that we cannot see but that we need to be aware of. And so Paul ministering to those people in that city, much like ours, is reminding them that it's a spiritual battleground and, and that, 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 listen, that spiritual transformation that they had all had, that they had all experienced, that spiritual transformation would lead to practical change. And we see the example of that when Paul first got to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, it reads like this. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had had, had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and they burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of those scrolls, they're like kind of like dark magic books, right? Uh, The the total came to 50,000 it's pieces of silver, okay? Uh, in, in, in this way, uh, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. 
It spread widely and grew in power as onlookers were like, Dude, what are these guys doing? Are they seriously throwing away that much money? Why don't they sell that stuff? I can't, what's happening here? You ever experienced that? You, you come to faith in Christ and everybody's like, I know, I know you as that guy, but now you're this guy. What, what happened? The power of the gospel to, to change lives, it is just so puzzling to the world. It's the greatest apologetic a Christian has. Because the world wants to argue science and politics and this, that, and the rest. And we're just like, look, you want to you argue, you want to battle about all these things? Okay, that's fine. But what you cannot deny me is a transformed life. And so you have all of these people who are publicly watching them burn their idols before everybody, thinking to themselves, what are these people doing? And others, no doubt, sharing with them, well, let me tell you what they're doing. These people have entered into a relationship with Jesus of Nazareth, the, the long-awaited and promised Messiah. He has come, and he lived that perfect life that, that we, we just couldn't do it. And then, and then just as, as, remember, they had the sacrificial system in Jerusalem and they would, they would slaughter um, sheep so that, that in, in slaughtering these, these blameless sheep, they, they would be able to, to cover their sins by the blood of those sheep. But this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the perfect spotless Lamb. And so he lived that perfect life and he, and he died that death that we deserved in our place as our substitute so that anybody who would place their, their, their faith and trust in Jesus who, who not only died for our sins, but rose again to stomp on the head of Satan, death, the devil. That God, th that's why they're doing all of this. Because God has made a way. Your spiritual hub will drive your practical choices, decisions, and actions in your life. See, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus like they did there in Ephesus, that informed their practical decisions and actions. I now love Jesus. He is my Lord, my God, my Savior, my King. No longer is sorcery and witchcraft and the occult and all of these other things I've, I've been steeped in for so many years that I've been in bondage to for so many years. That's not King in my life. And so because of that, I am going to now publicly and because of that inward transformation, I'm now going to publicly and practically burn all of my idols in front of everybody. That spiritual hub, that, that, that spiritual transformation will lead to practical change in our lives. So when we talk about prayer and we talk about a prayer that's going to impact not just us personally, but, but prayer that's going to transform our community, that should fire us up. Because that is a practical display in the spiritual of how we desire to see God work um, in our community. Some of you have heard this story, but a great friend of mine from Ghana named Bright, um, I used to minister to him and disciple him. Every week we would get together, we'd get in the Word, we'd talk life, we'd pray together. And Bright, man, listen, this guy, he lit up a room with his smile. He'd walk in, he'd smile, and everybody was smiling. And, and Bright was just a, just a, a guy who, who I, I led to faith in Christ, and he was, he was just excited about the things of God. And so one day we're sitting there at a table, and he says to me, Jimmy, you know, I, I've been... Um, I've been... Uh, I've been praying and, and, and what I've been doing is I've been fasting and praying and so I've been taking my notebook and my jug of water and I've been going up into the cliffs and the mountains in Mallorca, Spain and I've been, I've been there and I've just been, I've just been praying and I've been journaling and reading, reading the Bible and, and I feel like God has so clearly spoken to me that, that I, need to, um, I need to go and tell my family back in Ghana that they need to uh, burn their idols and turn to Jesus. But I'm not sure, is this really God speaking to me? And I, 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 don't, I don't know. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of like, wow, this is incredible. And I said to him, you listen, Bright, um, you know, one of the ways in which I, I kind of filter whether it's actually God speaking to me or not is, is whether it lines up with the word of God because God's never going to contradict himself. And so I said, L let me see what the Bible would say about that. A yes. Go and call them. Tell them what you believe he called you. He so he calls them. And he tells his mom and dad, listen, I know it's been a while since we've talked and I love you and I've met Jesus and this is what Jesus has done for me and he's radically transformed my life and he, he wanted me to tell you that he can do the same for you. But what, what, what he's asking you to do now is to, to choose this day. And so he wants you to choose him and he wants you to burn all of your idols that you've spent your entire life worshiping. 
And so they grabbed all of their idols, they turned to Jesus, and they burned them in the city center. And then they went to his cousins and his nephews and aunts and uncles, and, and all of them turned to Jesus, and they burned their idols. And then they went throughout the, the, the village there, and they, they were telling everybody, man, you got to turn to Jesus, man, and repent of your sins. And, and all these people repenting and, and, and turning to Jesus and burning their idols. And, and then his family took it upon themselves to then take that message of the gospel and go from village to village in Ghana telling people to turn to Jesus and burn their idols, all because one man was on a mountain in Spain, not Africa, praying, seeking God, and God gave him a word. And the radical impact of that word that God had, had given him. Because the spiritual informed the practical. I want to see, I don't know about you, but I, I want to see radical change in New York City. And I know that if we're going to see radical change in New York City, uh, we, we, need to get, we, we need to get radically praying. We need to pray radically. And so uh, what I want to do is I just want to show you guys a short uh, video. And, um, and this, was about, this was about four months ago. I was in Manhattan, and I was, I was uh, meeting with a, a group of church planters. And, and I watched this video, and it was, it was this video that has kind of informed the direction that we are going in 2020 with this, with this prayer initiative. It was this video that, that I... The, the conviction came in my own life and the conviction came that, man, as a church, we need to get serious about prayer because I want to see change. I want to see transformation. And, and I truly believe that it's going to come uh, through prayer. And so I'm going to watch this video real quick and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll wrap up the service. I'm Vance Pittman, the senior pastor here at Hope Church in Las Vegas. It's, it's an awesome opportunity for me every time I get the privilege to sit down with church planters because honestly, you're my heroes. I'm a church planter at heart. It's who I am. It's what God's called me to be. And I love the opportunity to invest in the lives of church planters and to just spend time with them. So thanks for taking the time to watch this today. Uh, this afternoon, we're really talking about the issue of faith and prayer as it relates to church planting. And there probably are not two words that are more linked to the issue of church planting than faith and prayer. I know for me, when God called me to church planting, um, it, it was overwhelming at first. When I thought about the responsibility and the opportunity to be involved in something like planting a new church because, to be honest with you, I didn't have a clue how to start. Uh, when, when we put our team together, we looked at each other and said, you know, God couldn't have picked three guys that knew less than we did about how to start a new church, particularly a church in a pioneer area like <coughs> where we're located here in Las Vegas. I'm originally from Alabama, and being from Alabama, growing up there, people don't talk about Las Vegas, and they definitely don't visit Las Vegas, and if they do, they don't tell anybody. It's just that kind of a city. So you couldn't have picked anybody that knew less than I did about coming to a place like Las Vegas and planting a new church. So the desperation factor for me was incredibly high, and it was probably one of the greatest challenges for me as a church planter, just the overwhelming sense of what God had invited us to do and my total lack of adequacy to accomplish what was before me. So that, that, that sense of overwhelming um, call produced a sense of desperation. And so what was a real challenge became a real uh, strength in planting a church because you need to be desperate for God. And that's exactly where we were. We knew if God's not God, we're sunk. And the whole issue of prayer and faith really um, hit us right in the face right when I got to Las Vegas. Uh, when I moved here, uh, I moved here in December of 2000. And in about the first or second week of 2001, in January, uh, I, I was sitting in my living room. I didn't know anybody in Las Vegas. We just moved here. Didn't, didn't know a soul. Didn't have any relationships really in the town. And my telephone rings, and I pick it up, and on the other end of the line, there's a young lady from the Philippines named Letty Peralta. And uh, Letty has since become legendary in our fellowship here at Hope. But Letty said, uh, she spoke a little bit of a broken English. She said, Pastor, can I tell you a story? And I said, well, Letty, I don't know anybody in Las Vegas. You can tell me any story you want to tell me. And Letty said, uh, 
Pastor, I'm from the Philippines. She said, I moved to Hong Kong to make money for my family that was very poor there in the Philippines. And she said, while living uh, there in Hong Kong, I met an American family and I moved in with them and became the live-in caretaker of their home, kind of a housekeeper and a keeper of their kids. And uh, from, from that point, uh, the family that she lived with really took her in. And then that family relocated from Hong Kong all the way to the United States of America to a suburb north of Atlanta, Georgia called Woodstock, Georgia. And they invited Letty to move with them. So they went through the process of filing for that paperwork in America. And she moved with this family from Hong Kong to Woodstock, Georgia, of all places. And while living in Woodstock, Georgia, Letty told me this. She said, I visited a church called the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia. And I heard a pastor named Johnny Hunt preach the gospel. And she said, God radically changed my life. But she said, I only got to go to that church about six or seven times before my family relocated again from Woodstock, Georgia, all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada. And she said, Vance, I've lived in, Wood in, uh, in Las Vegas now for a year and a half, and I've prayed every day that the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia, would start a church in Las Vegas, Nevada. And she said, Pastor Vance, could you please tell me what church sent you to Las Vegas, Nevada? Now, at this point, I'm sitting there on the phone, and my jaw is literally hanging wide open because it was that very church, the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia, that had sent my family over 2,000 miles to the other side of the country to join in God's activity of launching a new church. And we had no idea Letty even existed. Nobody at First Woodstock even knew her or had ever even met her. She was just here praying. And so the story of our church here in Las Vegas, people ask all the time because we're now <coughs> 11 years old and have been involved in planting 16 new churches and we're working on four continents around the world, training hundreds on an annual basis of, of international leaders and national leaders in countries. People call and say, man, what did you guys do? How did it happen? And to be totally honest with you, the story of our fellowship from its very beginning is really the answered prayer of one little Filipino lady who just loved Jesus and by faith trusted Jesus to do incredible things above and beyond anything she could imagine. And so right from the very beginning, that shaped us as a young fellowship. We were just a handful of people meeting in my living room. On the first night we gathered in February, we had 18 adults in my living room. But, but the story of Letty and her testimony and her prayer and her faith really shaped us as a fellowship and it kind of developed a rally cry in our church where we said we don't pray before we work prayer is the work then God works and everything about our fellowship began to be driven and motivated by this idea that we didn't come to start anything we were simply joining in what God was already doing and our response was simply to respond in faith trusting that God would do everything that he said he was going to do, that God would be faithful to finish what he began if we simply stayed out of the way and stayed completely dependent upon him. So from that moment on, we simply rode a wave of the favor of God in response to the prayers of his people. And it really affected our strategy early on as a fellowship. When we started to uh, develop our strategy for how to plant, this idea of prayer and faith just really shaped it. And our strategy was somewhat agricultural. We basically took the first five months of being here in Las Vegas, and our strategy was to cultivate the field with prayer. To do like a farmer would do in a field, to go out and tear up the fallow ground and break up the soil to prepare it for the planting of the seed. And we knew that in a city like Las Vegas, it, it demanded that we engage uh, the spiritual culture and climate that was here and break up the hard uh, spiritual ground and, and just begin to cultivate that field. And we knew the only way to do that was through prayer. So strategically what we did uh, was we took the, first of all, the Las Vegas phone book. Now I know that sounds kind of funny now because nobody even uses a phone book anymore. But back in the day, 12 years ago when we started, people still used the phone book. And all the names of the people that had phone numbers here in Las Vegas were listed in the book. And so we took the Las Vegas phone book. We distributed it to three different churches and we prayed over every name in the Las Vegas phone book. If your name was in the Las Vegas phone book in the year 2001, we prayed by name three times over every person two specific things. God, open their hearts to the gospel 
And Lord, raise up labors for the harvest. The second thing that we prayed, or, or the way that we prayed, was we brought out mission teams. And we took the five zip codes <coughs> that surrounded our target area, roughly about 50,000 households in those five zip codes. And with those five mission teams in our core group, we prayer walked 50,000 households on the south end of Las Vegas. We walked up and down every street, and we prayed specifically over every home, those same two things. God, would you open their hearts to the gospel, and Lord, would you raise up laborers for the harvest, knowing that what God was going to do in our city required others to join in our fellowship so that we could disciple and send out laborers in, into, the, into the mission field. So for five months, all we did as a fellowship was pray. We met in my home on Sunday nights. We'd do a Bible study together, and we'd prayer walk. We didn't hand out any invite cards. Uh, we didn't send out any mailers. We didn't do any of that. We just simply, February of 2001, started a Bible study in my home, 18 adults. Uh, our team made up a lot of that. We had uh, three families that moved here together. So the 18 adults, we were six of them. We had 12 adults that we'd engaged in Las Vegas, and that 18 started in February. And then over five months, we prayer walked those 50,000 households. But let me tell you what happened. Between February and early June, we saw that little core group of 18 grow to 70 people meeting in my home. Again, not passing out invite car cards, not doing mailers, but God just literally began to... We would have people come and knock on the door, and they would literally say... We hear there's a church meeting here. Can we come in? And the stories of how God connected those people, the stories of how God brought those people, some of them believers, some of them unbelievers, to establish that core is just amazing. I don't have time to tell you all the stories of how God began to connect people in that fellowship. But early on in our home, we saw a multicultural, multi-generational fellowship, people from multiple nations, multiple ethnicities, and all the generational spectrums began to gather to the point where we would have to move all of our furniture out of our home and literally put seating just to get the 70 people crammed into our home. I mean, it, they literally didn't fit. Our home's not that big a place. And so, but, but all of that born out of this idea of just trusting God to do what he said he would do. And again, believing prayer is not what we do as Christians simply at the beginning before we work. Prayer is the work. Everything God desires to do in his sovereignty, he's chosen to do it in response to the prayers of his people. And I'll be honest with you, I don't understand everything about what I just said. I believe in a sovereign God who is sitting on the throne of the universe and his plans are established in eternity past. But I also believe that the Bible says that God, within the scope of His sovereignty, has chosen to work in response to the prayers of His people. And that just became the passion of our fellowship early on. As we prayed, as we trusted God, and what it did to grow the faith of our people as we would pray. And I'll give you an example of one of the stories early on. We were meeting in my home, like I said, and, and we just could not get another person in our home. We literally, the last night, had people sitting on the kitchen counter. It was that packed in our living room. And I can remember standing up in front of our group that night and wanting to be the leader, wanting to be the guy that said, here's where we're going, here's what we're going to do, here's what God's shown us. And yet so frustrated because I didn't know what the next step was. God hadn't made it clear. I just knew we were where we were supposed to be that night. And I said to our team, 70 of us in the living room, hey, we need a place to meet next week. I don't know how to do it. I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know how God's going to provide, but I want us to pray. And so, man, as a group there, we just started praying in our living room, opened it up for people to pray. And I remember one elderly gentleman, he was about 70 years old, and uh, his name was Lowell. And Lowell began to pray, and here's what Lowell said. He said, Lord, you've called this group of people together. God, you've assembled this group in this home. And, and Lowell was a guy from <coughs> Northern California. He was a retired oil executive. And, and, and Lowell was kind of rough and brass around the edges. And, and Lowell just said this in his prayer. He said, Lord, you brought this young man out here from Alabama. And I didn't believe this was going to happen. And Lord, I'm watching it happen right in front of my eyes. But Lord, now we need a place. And here's what Lowell said. Lord, we're coming after you. And as Lowell prayed that prayer, it was like in me, I just sensed this, yes, God is going to do something in response to the prayer and faith of his people. The next week, I was on a t-ball field coaching my son in Little League. 
And I looked up across the field and I saw a guy that I knew I recognized. His name was Randall Cunningham, the former NFL MVP quarterback for the Eagles and the, the uh, Vikings and the Ravens and the Cowboys and heyday with the Eagles. And I knew when I saw Randall who he was and I knew his testimony for the gospel and for Christ. So I just went up to him and said, hey, man, I just want you to know I appreciate your stand in the public sector for Christ and all that God's used you to do. And Randall asked me the same two questions everybody did when they heard my accent in Las Vegas. They said, where are you from? And I told him I was from Alabama. And he said, what are you doing here? I told him we'd moved here to start a church. And I told him what we were going through. And Randall said, hey, I got a studio downtown. I'd love to invite you guys to come as long as you need to and use our studio. So boom, one week we pray. The next week, God opens the door. That next weekend, we moved in Randall's facility, started meeting there. And that, that just was a continued pattern of God moving in response to the prayers of his people. So God provides. God always meets the need. God always leads and guides and, 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 and takes care of all the details. I love what Paul wrote when he said, faithful is he who calls you and he will also bring it to pass. Here's what that means. God didn't just call you to church planting. God's already taken care of all the details. Your responsibility is not to figure it out, dream it up, or plan it. Your responsibility is to trust him. It's to trust Him, to walk in complete dependence on Him. So as I bring this little section to a close, let me just remind you that church planting is a journey of prayer and faith, which means ultimately it's a journey of dependence on God. That's really what faith is. Faith is our dependence, our radical dependence on God. But don't forget what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. He said, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. You know what that means? Until you hear God speak, it's not faith. Too many times I hear church planters and those involved in, in, in mission activity say, well, I'm not real sure what God's leading me to do, so I'm just going to step out in faith. Listen to me. Let me protect you. That is not faith. That's presumption on God, and that's a very dangerous way to live your life, to lead your family, and to plant your church. Faith demands intimacy with God. You cannot live by faith if you are not walking in intimate fellowship with God to hear Him speak clearly into your life. And until He speaks, you wait to hear God speak. So the greatest thing you can do to lead your church plant by faith, through prayer, to trust God with great risk for all that He has in store, the greatest thing you can do is day by day walk intimately with God. Church planter, everything God desires to do through your life, He'll do out of the overflow of what He's doing in your life. Don't ever forget, God's primary call on your life is not ministry. It's not church planting. God's primary call on your life is intimacy. And out of the overflow of an intimate fellowship with Him, as you walk by faith, God will do through you what you never dreamed possible. So, enjoy the journey of walking with Him by faith. What if, what if we believe God for something so much bigger and so much greater than we could ever, ever do in our own strength? Why can't God bring revival? Seriously, why can't He? Why can't God use us? The answer is he can. And sometimes when I think about how much, listen, I, I just, my, my grandfather died this week and, and it was, you know, it's, it's just been a weird week. You know, I didn't, I didn't really have a great relationship with him. And, um, and to be perfectly honest with you, he wasn't really a great guy. Um, but I remember driving out to the hospital. And I, remember, I remember praying with him. Um, as he just looked like a shell of himself. He just looked like a skeleton with skin. It was, 
I remember praying with him and he couldn't, he couldn't talk. He had tubes down his throat, and, 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 but he could hear everything. And so I remember just sharing the gospel with him. And I remember how much, how anti-gospel, anti-Jesus, he just hated the things of God. And I remember sitting there, I remember preaching the gospel to him. I remember just kind of you know, praying the, 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 a prayer to, to receive Jesus with him and, and just letting him know, listen, if, if, if you want Jesus, you can pray this in your heart even now. And, and I would love to say he ripped the tubes out and said, Jesus, you know, but that, I did, that just didn't happen. I don't know. I don't know whether he is in heaven with Jesus or whether he has been eternally separated from God. I don't know. But what I do know is as I I was driving home, as I was driving home from the hospital out in Long Island, I, I I just kept thinking. I couldn't stop thinking, man. I don't I don't want to be a famous pastor, whatever that even is. I don't, I don't want all that stuff. I don't, want, I don't even care about a big church. I just want to see the people of New York City come to know Jesus. That's what I want. If God brought a revival and everybody got saved and they went to other churches and it was just us here, I'm good with that. I just want to see people come to know Jesus. And I thought to myself, as much as I love this city, And as much as I love the people of this city, he loves them more. He loves this city more. He loves the people of this city more. So why can't he bring revival? Why wouldn't he bring revival? Why can't he use us? Why wouldn't he use us? There are are just a couple quick things that stood out to me in this video. The first one was that the, the fact that this little lady from the Philippines, God used this little lady, honored the prayers of this little lady, And today, because of the prayers of that little lady, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have come to to faith in Jesus Christ. Because of, at that point, 16 churches that were planted globally. His is a gigantic megachurch. Four different continents at that time. Because one lady said, man, we need a gospel-centered, Bible-teaching church in Las Vegas. Their prayer strategy was so paramount to everything that God did in and through that church. They did not have social media. They did not have some kind of big, fancy marketing rollout. They had prayer. And in 2020, as a church, we are going to have a hyper focus on prayer. Just trusting and believing that God can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever think, ask, or imagine. Believing Him for it, trusting Him for it. Not just talking about it and preaching about it, but actually stepping out in faith and, and, and putting our uh, money where our mouth is, so to speak. We are going to get very practical and very strategic. And here's what that's going to look like for us as a church. Um, every Saturday for this entire year, Every Saturday, we are going to gather at different strategic meeting points, and there will be papers just like this passed out, these prayer agendas uh, for each of those Saturdays, and there'll be a map of the specific streets that we're going to walk that day, spend an hour from 10 to 11 just walking the streets there and praying. And some people will meet up beforehand and get breakfast, and some people will meet up afterwards and grab lunch and fellowship. But for that hour, we are going to be given to prayer, going through different streets and different blocks within a radius of of, of this church. We want to see God bring transformation and God uh, bring change. And so there'll be a a verse and there'll be a couple prayer points, things that we want to pray for, that God would open blind eyes and soften hard hearts and draw people to himself, that God would raise up laborers for the harvest. There'll be quotes Things like, uh, there's nothing that will cause you to love the people of your city more than praying for them. And so we'll have these sheets and we'll meet at strategic points and we'll, we'll walk those streets and we'll pray for every single house and every person in those houses. And when we come to apartment buildings, we, we'll even go up to the, the little doorbells and we'll see every name and we'll pray over every name. So that by the end of 2020, there's going to be a massive circle around where this church is of of individuals, of people, of families that have been prayed over, that God would move in their lives and move in their hearts. And and let's just see what God does. I mean, I'm excited for it. I believe God is going to do some incredible things. And so as a leadership, we've said, listen, as leaders, 
we're going to be given to this. Because sometimes you think, oh my God, every Saturday for the whole year? And then I thought to myself, you know what? That's actually not really a big deal because churches have prayer meetings weekly all over the city. So it's, it's actually not, it's not really as big a deal as you think. It's just we're getting super specific and strategic with it. That's going to be the difference. But, but in every facet of the ministry, we want to, you know I, know, I know I've talked with Joe and Short about, man, we want to kind of implement more of a prayer culture in our community groups. And we want, we want every facet of this ministry, we, we need to be a prayerful people, a dependent people. And so we're going to hit the ground and we're going to hit the ground uh, running. Um, and, and, and listen, if, if, you're, you know, if you're sick or there's an emergency or you've got to go out of town, nobody's like, why didn't this person show up to the prayer meeting? It's not the way it's going to work. As a leadership, we're saying, as leaders, we're going to lead the way. As leaders, we're going to be there. Say an emergency. But we're going to be there. And so what we're going to do next week is perhaps for some of you, you're like, I, I couldn't make it every Saturday. We don't want any kind of guilt put on anybody. We're going to have an iPad up there next week, and, and you'll be able to sign up. Maybe you're like, listen, I can commit to once a month. I can commit to once a month. And our college ministries are going to be coming back over the next couple weeks. And so we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do with the chairs in here and all that good stuff. But, but, but they're coming back, and they're going to be a part of this kind of strategy to, to reach our city. And this Saturday, we're going to kick it off with a special time right here. We're going to kick it off with a special time. There's going to be praise and worship. We're going to be lifting up our voices in, in prayer. And, and that's where we're going to start. And then every week after that, we're getting together with these forms. And we're going to be walking the streets and praying for people and individuals in our city. And, and just let me, I just want to close it with a, a quote. Uh, the, the great uh, Scottish preacher, uh, John Knox. I, I love John Knox. I, I've been to his house. He's not alive. Um, but it's a historical thing in Scotland. Uh, just throwing that out there. It has nothing to do with what I'm about to tell you. Also into his church. Amazing man of God. Amazing man of God who had a heart and a passion for his country like you'd never believe. And, and he is the one who is quoted as saying, um, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. It was that John, John uh, uh, Knox whom the, the, the bloody Queen Mary, not a Christian, had said of this man, I fear the prayers of this man more than the, all the armies of Europe. Imagine that, a non-believer saying that about your prayer life. And so that's going to be the rally cry of this church. That is going to be our prayer, just as one of the fathers of modern missions said, man, we expect great things, attempt great things. Give us New York City lest we die. Lord, we're coming after you.